Hi guys, welcome to this video. My name's Anthony Cummins and I'm gonna take you through today how to think like Sun Tzu. Now, everything you are going to see today in this video is actually taken from my book, The Ultimate Art of War, a step-by-step -step illustrated guide to Sun Tzu's teachings by myself, Anthony Cummins. We're gonna be using um, Samurai Battles Miniatures 1 70 second scale with their grid formation. And uh, it's gonna be a bit of a long video, but I hope you enjoy it. Sit down, relax, get yourself a cup of tea before you start, get in a comfortable mood, and then make sure you do watch it to the end. Because I think with a lot of the time with YouTube videos, you'll click off soon. Just keep going, get to the end and enjoy it. And tell me what you think in the comments below about the tactics of Sun Tzu. Now I've set my book up in this way where it's lesson two, lesson three, so etc. So I'm literally going to just tell you the lesson numbers. You don't need the page numbers, you can go straight to the lesson. And we're going to start with the obvious, um, the five constant factors. The way, heaven, earth, the commander, organization. And we're going to go through them now um, as the five. So let's start with the way. Now the way here is actually this way here. However, in this context, it generally means harmony among the people. So let's look at these two uh, armies here, the red army and the white army. Which do you want as which one has got more harmony among the people? Now, the obvious answer is the left white one. That's not true. That has more discipline and organization. What the way means here is which army or people are happy with each other. So even though they are heavily regulated, maybe there is a blood feud between this family and that family, or maybe they hate each other, that there's no unity between them socially. There's no social unity. But what about these guys? They look pretty disorganized, but what if they're all from the same family? They've got the same family surname. They're from the same area. The people are happy, but the general is just not great great discipline. So here for the way, which is, you can see is lesson three, you actually have to realize it's not about organization. It's are the people happy? Is there harmony in the army? This also includes corruption and injustice. Basically, is everybody in the force happy? Obviously, they're probably not happy to be at war, but they are not like under tyranny, under hatred, they're in fear of their own people totally, they hate each other, so don't mix those two up. Now we're going to move on to the second and the third constant factors, heaven and earth. You'll find these in lessons four and five, the more detailed version. Now, heaven and earth for Sun Tzu are not esoteric. So here we go into yin and yang, hot and cold, and also as you can see on this side, highest mountains, distances, ground, forces have to climb steep mountains, etc., etc. So what we're talking here is you've got to work out whether A, everybody is happy in the land and in the army. B, what is the weather like in the season you're in? What is the weather like actually on the day of battle? What is the terrain like? What do you have to look at in the terrain? The next thing we have to look at is the commander. Who is the commander of the army? We're not also at the background, you get other commanders and other central figures before you get to the very lowly Ashigaru or, you know, um, foot soldier at the back. But our main focus here is who is your commander? What is he like? Is he a rash person? Is he a good person? Is he over disciplined? What is he like? And finally, we get to organization. Let's have a look at the organization here. As you can see, this is just a rabble. There might be many of them. They may be great warriors, but they may come at war in a very individualistic way. They might not enjoy being in units. They may be what we call Homeric type of warfare, individual warriors seeking um, great rewards and great honor. But then you get the other type of army, which is this. This chap here has direct connection to these two commanders here. Those two commanders talk to those commanders in the background who talk to other commanders who then give um, their orders to 
the lesser soldiers. So we know whatever he decides quickly gets spread to the most amount of people and which allows them to do their job. This gives you a highly disciplined and highly effective army with a central leader who can talk straight to his forces across possibly miles of land and through thousands of people by focusing his orders on a very select few, which will in turn move its way down to the lowest ranks. In contrast, this commander has to try to spread the word without any organisation and he has to try to fight against the rabble. Even though they might be great soldiers, he has to try to fight against the concept of the rabble. OK, how many times have you heard that Sun Tzu says the art of war is the art of deception? How many times have you heard that? It's one of the most famous um, quotes from Sun Tzu. Well, actually, this is what we have here. It's a form of deception with the way. Now, you, most people know this way from Karate Do, Aikido. So what Sun Tzu is saying here is that deception is the key, the key to winning war. Now, that doesn't mean it's all deception or guerrilla warfare. There's a central focus and then a deceptive second element. Now, let's jump ahead in the book for the moment to Lesson 66. We'll go back, but this is the direct answer to that question. What does his Sun Tzu mean by war is the way of deception? So this is what he actually means. So basically, you've got the direct approach towards your enemy. But then you've also got the indirect approach. So the direct approach is what keeps the enemy at bay. It keeps them focused on you. But the indirect, the deception, the hidden comes from another direction. It's not necessarily always flanking. This is just a diagram that means, you know, gives you a basic idea. But actually what it means is that there's something the enemy has not thought about. Your direct action has put them into a certain situation and your indirect action, your deception has taken the victory. What a lot of people don't realise is actually that after this saying of deception, there are 14 separate deceptions that he goes through. So here in my book, I've put in like the, all of these. This is the fifth of the 14 deceptions, etc. And we, I'm going to show you now the sixth of the 14 deceptions. And that is create disorder and strike. What we have here is a very disciplined army. Can you imagine trying to come into that? You know full well that they have everything ready to go. And that getting into that is going to be very, very difficult. So what you need to do is create disorder within that. Now, this can either be done through espionage. It can be done through planting in um, agents in there. It could be done by smoke screens from the, you know, smoke fires from the left or the right. It could be done by um, the use of the landscape to change their formation. It doesn't matter what it is. The point is, is you have to deceive the enemy some way or manipulate the enemy so that they move and scatter. Only then, only then should you attack with your forces. There's no point in attacking that which is set up. So what's happened here is we, we've been able to scatter them by some means that we have constructed. For some means, which is part of what an excellent general is, you have to find those means. We've scattered those troops, which means the enemy or out us, depending on which side you're on, can come in in formation and start smashing through them. There was no point in those forces from the red side trying to smash through the organized forces of the white side. But as a great general, we've put something in place. The enemy has been dispersed or moved. That they think we're far away. Remember, that's one of Sun Tzu's other deceptions. He says, make the enemy think you're not close. Then when you break up to break the formation, break camp, in you come from nowhere. Bang. And you start smashing through in to enemy lines. Then out again you go. It's got to be fast. It's got to be quick. OK, lesson 23. This is the last of the 14 deceptions appear where and when unexpected again with Sun Tzu it's always the same it's an application it's a, it's a principle 
that you apply to a situation. So each way is different. So this army expects to face the front. Here they are. They're facing the front. They know all their reports have said the enemy are coming from the front. And where I am behind the camera, they're facing a massive force. So imagine my point of view is a force. They're looking at it, the direct assault. They're like, OK, we're ready. Now, all their reports have said, all their reports have said to their left flank, there is forest, there is bog, there's no way to get, or it's very un unlikely that anybody would put cavalry through that area. Now, maybe you could send false reports. Maybe you could include converted spies, which he talks about later. There's all different ways of creating a false sense of security on this left flank. So we appear when we're not expected. Boom, from the flank. He's expecting a front assault. But we have come through that forest, we've got through the mire, we've got through the mud, or overnight we've laid out all sorts of planks of wood or whatever you want. Whatever you've got to your use or whatever you can use, use it to appear from places where nobody expects you to come from. And here we can smash through his left flank all the way through and destroy his army from a place that is not expected so again as you can see we are not expected from here because the terrain is wrong or maybe the terrain is a little bit too difficult but we send our best riders we put um, a call throughout the army we need a squad of the best riders we have okay we found a hundred riders who think they can get through that rocky mountain pass OK, let's get them going. They might be experts in their own territory. For those who are interested, just as a little bit of an extra, in this book, we've actually got all the original um, titles from Sun Tzu's Art of War in calligraphy written for us by a monk in Japan. This is the calligrapher. This is Yamamoto Juho, and he is from Wakayama. And he is, as you can see, from Eunji Temple. Now, Eunji Temple is the grave of Master uh, Isui Sensei, so he's called Isui Sensei, and he is a very famous samurai, and he did the Book of Samurai series. So Isui Sensei was alive in the 1600s, and he wrote these. These are the start of uh, a probably eight-part section on a full samurai school, and they are not small chaps, they are not small, and he was a real samurai writing about real things, including the arts of the ninja, based on, of course, his understanding of warfare, which was samurai understanding, and without doubt, his focus or main basic building block was Sun Tzu's art of war, which in Japanese is called Sonshi no Heiho. The next lesson is extremely interesting, lesson 49. It talks about when you outnumber the enemy. So this time we'll be on the white side, and what it says here is, when you outnumber the enemy, 10 to 1, so this is just a symbolic representation. But when you outnumber the enemy 10 to 1, you can always attack them. Your forces are so overwhelming that unless there's something ridiculous you've not thought about, like a, a massive trap um, or you're at sea, which is totally different, by the way, at sea because you're under the, um, the power of nature there. But unless there's something absolutely ridiculous that you've missed, 10 to 1, you're going to kill them. So obviously it wouldn't mean, you know, uh, just like this. If the army is, say, a thousand strong and you have 10,000 people, you can surround them and kill them. There's no way they can outflank you, but you can always outflank them. You can always get around them and you can always kill them. If you outnumber the enemy five to one, then you can bring a direct assault here with two flanking assaults. So if it's five to one, you can do a direct assault with indirect assault. Do you remember we spoke about it before? That's now, with 10 to 1, your tactics don't need to be so hard, but you just have to not mess up because you're so overwhelming. But with 5 to 1, tactics start to play a part now, and if they do really good tactics, they, may, they might outdo you. So here you have to start thinking about direct and indirect assaults where 10 to 1 is quite direct. If you have double amount of the men the enemy have, so for every 
one of the enemy, you have two, you can flank them from either side, okay? And use flanking maneuvers and you can bring them, hopefully divide your forces into two, hopefully bring them around and try to um, come at them from two directions because you're making them fight on two fronts. If you make them fight on only one front, they might simply just be better than you and outdo you, even though they have got less of um, a number to attack you with. Just out of interest, I've moved all the uh, warriors to one side so they're not in the background so much, but it does look good, doesn't it? I think, personally, guys, that if you start to add this more three-dimensional history into things, then uh, you start to see these teachings much, much better. So again, thank you very much for the Natoru students who donated to buy these um, figures, to put the grass on them, to do all the painting. They still need painting, but I've got them at least to the basic form. So we've just done what happens if you outnumber the enemy. So again, we're going to be on the white side against the red side. And this time we're going to look at what happens if the reds outnumber us. For those who are following in the book, we're on lesson 50. Okay, the first one is this. If you have equal numbers, attack. Because you should have strategy in place. You have the terrain to your advantage. You have better organisation. You have better commanders, or that's the hope. So you should be able to outdo them simply with tactics. So in this situation, you should actually employ your tactics and advance sorry guys i'm trying to look through uh, the screen and it doesn't really work but if i look through uh, away from the screen i actually i'm filming away from it so there you go so you move up to attack if the enemy outnumber you by a fractional amount or you don't start to outnumber you you don't have to run away but you go into heavy defense mode you now put your forms together Get your whatever weapons of the day, whether it be muskets in Japan or um, old firearms in China or even archers. Just get everything ready so that the enemy are going to struggle to assail you. You have to find the best ground. You have to find the best defences such as rivers and mountains and just defend yourself. Here we're on open ground. So, you know, the models don't quite show it because clearly you could say, well, you can be outflanked. But the point here is that you are going to find a place that you can defend against a slightly larger enemy. If you are totally outnumbered, run away. It's that simple. Withdraw. Get out of there. Move. There's no real, you know, place that's going to keep you safe from an overwhelming army. Let's look at the 300 in Thermopylae. We all know that one from the film, 300. At the time, they had about seven, six or 7,000 people in the pass, uh, including the 300 uh, Spartans, um, alongside Athenians, etc. And the Persians way outnumbered them. So even though they made a great stand, they died and they were defeated. Why? Because Sun Tzu says... If you've got a significantly smaller force, no matter how good your tactics are, you will be killed. And Unless, like in that situation, you're a stopping force, you need to retreat. Remember, smaller units, smaller armies can move faster than larger armies. So get out of the way and tire the enemy out. Okay, for this lesson, we're going to look at uh, a squad itself. In this situation here, the reds are the foot soldiers, the white flag is the leader. So you need to build your army of small sections with individual leaders so that you can break them up uh, or build them up depending on what you want to do. So I'll show you here. So basically, that there is that individual squad with, doesn't matter how many men he has, it's normally decimal. So they can come together or they can disband. They can make four units, 50 units, 100 units, it doesn't matter. So your army, each section should have someone who is in direct link to the chain of command and the rest of them listen to him. And he goes, gets his orders, comes back, moves away. In this way, you can talk to 10 people and have 100 people move. 
So here, let's imagine we have a 10-man squad, okay? The one with the white flag runs off to get his orders from the rest of the army. And here we have nine men with him. So it's a 10-man squad. That means 10 leaders can quickly move 100 people. So 100 people can move 1,000. 1,000 people can move 10,000. And it gets more than that. So, for example, if you have one leader for 100 men, you know, it goes up. But there is a calculation where, basically, if you have one leader has too many people to control, the army will start to break up. That's why you place them into individual squads with a hierarchy so that you can quickly build or dismantle an army with very minimum effort. Otherwise, you have to speak to 10,000 people individually. Okay, lesson 70, the circle of the orthodox and unorthodox. Let's have a look at this. Now, you need to understand that this is one of the points in the art of war that people actually debate quite, you know, quite vigorously, is what does it mean? He talks about the formlessness and the 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 form with no head and things like that. Many people have come to see this as a circle, and this does appear in Japanese literature as a circle. And the point of this formation is thus: these men know the enemy is somewhere. They're not quite sure which direction they are coming from, so they form a circle. The reason is because of this. They know the enemy is nearby and they're not sure where he is, where he's coming from. But they've had reports that the enemy are coming and they don't know which pass they're going to take, which mountain road they're going to take. They just know they're on the way. So they formed a circle. But lo and behold, as time progresses, the enemy make their appearance. They're coming from this direction. So the reason they've done a circle is so that they can quickly adjust to that direction. So as the enemy have been spotted, these three here or this section of the army become the forward point. The ones behind form up behind them. That circle has now turned into the arrow formation with a central commander who has rear units ready to flank. He has chosen this formation. He could have chosen a different one. But the point is, is that from a circle, you can easily just simply aim towards the enemy at any point. So the enemy will be forced down or forced to fight like that. And these can then come out and attack or flank round. And as the enemy are forced round, the enemy pushed where they need to go, you suddenly find that they are flanking. Sorry, guys, I can't quite focus where the screen is versus I need someone to hold the screen for me. So uh, sorry about that. But basically, as you can see, they've pushed round, flanking units have moved and they can now become stuck between two forces. So you see how it works from circle, find where the enemy is, move into position, break the enemy up and trap them. OK, for those who know the basics about Japanese samurai, you have Ashigaru, lower foot soldiers, and then actual samurai. Let's have a look at him. So across the board, the samurai should be better than the Ashigaru because the Ashigaru is either a labourer who turned warrior for the uh, season campaign once a year or twice a year. The samurai should be a standard train every day warrior of course this is not always true you get natural abilities but on the whole this is the point so we have a mixture of troop types we have lesser ability and higher ability troops and you, Sun Tzu tells us that you have to mix these troops for different reasons and different ways of mixing them so here we have a troop of Ashigaru so foot soldiers or in China low level foot soldiers they might be equipped well they might look smart, they might even march well together or even be able to point their spears in the same direction. That doesn't mean they're going to be brave, amazing soldiers. So just because they look the part doesn't mean they are the part. In the military, you can turn someone into a basic marching soldier within a couple of months, a few weeks and show them what to do, some very basic steps 
and then do it. An individual can do some great stuff. A unit takes a long time to train because you have to unify all of the minds of the individual. So to Sun Tzu's mind, this is a weak troop. Why? Because they will break easily. They have only basic training. They're not the most brave people in the world, so they're quite actually weak. So this is a weak point in your army. This is a breaking So, point. as you can see here, they're all the same. They have the same spears moving the same direction. Here, they are all independent. Now, Isui Sensei, in the Book of Samurai series, tells us, he says, if the troops move together, their spears move in line, they all step together, they are weak soldiers. Because they've been trained to do that for a few weeks and they come out a few times a year to have a go at it. They're weak soldiers. You can easily break these people. He says if you find a group of men who move their feet independently, they move their weapons independently, but they move as a single squad, they are very hard professional warriors because they know what they're doing they know how to attack independently but they can also stay together as a unified uh, a unified section that's the difference between weaker soldiers and harder soldiers however Sun Tzu gives another technique for this Sun Tzu says you should mix them in mix hard professional warriors with lower level warriors. Why? Because you get a balance across the army. You get a balance of feeling. The low level guys will drag the high level guys back a bit, but the high level guys will pull the low level guys up a lot more to their level. So instead of breaking, they will feel secure because they're next to famous warriors or hard warriors or very disciplined troops. So they won't break and run, which means one of your flanks won't be destroyed. So it's better to have a uniformed mix of emotion, ability and psychology than it is to have separate units, except for in the following situation. Sun Tzu says when you need special troops, pick the people for their one ability. If you need hard men like this crew, you get the hardest men you can find because they are going to be bloodthirsty, horrible buggers who are going to go in and start beat, you know, massacring people and they're going to be a hard wedge. If you need fast people, pick fast people. If you need stealthy people, pick stealthy people. But you do not mix in lower level soldiers with these. You never do that. Because you will bring the hardness, the stealth, the speed down. And these people are used in special forces situations. When you need special forces, by that I mean forces that have specialities to do special tasks. You do not mix in those who can't do the task. They have to be able to do the task. This is what he means by orthodox troops mixed in and unorthodox troops those who are simply do their single job okay lesson 86 steer the enemy away from your defenses so you've got an encampment it's your encampment you want to keep it safe the enemy are clearly big enough to besiege you they're clearly big enough to give serious damage to your fortress you're not ready for the siege. You have not got everything, all your supplies ready. So what do you do? Sun Tzu tells us in this situation, you move away. Leave the fortress. Go on the run. Get the enemy to follow you. So in this situation, you've led the enemy away. Now they're going to move away. You have to obviously flee because they're bigger than you. Otherwise, you'd be giving them battle. So you get on that. You move fast. Move, remember, move as fast as lightning. Um, and as quick as the wind or strike as quick as lightning and move as fast as the wind but what's happened is the enemy have not gone against your camp if they had have done in this situation they'd have destroyed your camp and you might have lost a lot of men doing it therefore you save the camp you tire out the enemy you move away and you go into evasive tactics lesson 89 now let's weaken one of the sides so 
your enemy are set up quite strong and we want to attack this their left flank so what we need to do is weaken the left flank by forcing them to move things over to the right flank so how do we do this so this is their right flank we move a false attack in we move so that they are falsely attacked there you go guys so they've come in for an attack so these are going to move to support it they're not going to totally leave everything unattended but they're going to try to block that attack because all all of our um deception tactics all of the reports all of the false flags false fires uh, false bush or false um, dust clouds, whatever you want to do, have told the army the attack is coming from the right flank. But what they're then unaware of is that the major attack is actually coming from their left flank. So we put in all of our forces. These were hidden. Remember the deceptions when make your enemy think you are far away. So now what we've got is this situation. They have moved their strength to their right flank and left their left flank exposed. Sorry, left their left flank exposed. So the left flank is now exposed to a more powerful attack. Before it wasn't, they could brace. Now they can't. As you can see, they've broken through and they're going to smash through that. And coincidentally, there is a pincer movement going on because we have a false attack on their right flank, our left flank. Lesson 108 is the very famous one that everybody knows and that Takeda Shingen used on his battle flag. That is basically be as swift as the wind. So an army must march great speed. Must be as ordered as a forest, as steady as a mountain, as basically um, intense as fire. They must be obscure like the dark and they must strike like lightning. Lesson 122 is one of the more difficult ones to illustrate. Obviously, I won't be doing this with uh, models. And again, you can see this is the fourth of Sun Tzu's eight military ways. So there are four of this, eight of that, five of that, seven of this. They're all here in the book, guys, for you to do. For example, if we go back a few. So strength and control. This is the third of four lessons on control. So that's the type of thing you're going to get from Sun Tzu. But here we are talking about do not attack troops in a state of power. So it's difficult to explain. When the troops are declining in their power, they're tired, they're restless, they are undisciplined, they're drunk, whatever it is, when they're on the wane, attack. The moment the troops are starting to get their strength back and happy, getting together, their moral is good, defend yourself. Don't bother attacking. When you find the rhythm that they're down again, attack. When their rhythm changes to high moral, morale, sorry, at, uh, defend. This is the rhythm of war. So the rhythm of war. So observe the enemy's rising and falling levels of energy. Only attack when their energy is in decline. Remember that. Okay, lesson 125. Give the enemy a way out. Remember before we said if you outnumber the enemy 10 to 1, then you can surround and kill them. If you don't, you probably can't because it's too difficult. So what happens here is when you surround someone, which you can't really annihilate without losing a lot of your own troops, give them a way out. Why? Because they're defeated, they're on their last legs, they are absolutely, absolutely going to fight to the death. They are going to be a hard enemy. The more you corner the enemy, the more they will fight back. So this is also done in lesson 126. Do not press a desperate enemy. This is in Sun Tzu's eight military ways. The seventh and the eighth military way talk about this. So what you do... Remember, guys, this is over quite a lot of land. These are just symbolic. But you open up a place for them to run to. So you open up a place where they can go. And as you see now, they can escape. This might seem counterintuitive to let an army escape when you literally could defeat them. But the, the point here is there's deeper elements. 
They are going to fight to the death. You are going to lose people. And what's the result? They won't join the battle next time because they're all dead. But in this situation, you've broken the back of the army. You've captured their supply trains. You've captured all of their chariots or their horses. They need to escape. They're trying to escape. They want to go home. Simply let them go home. They're hundreds of miles away probably. They won't be back again for a few years. So instead of losing men this year in this season and campaign, just to defeat them so they don't turn up and fight you again in a week, just let them go. You get the same, same result and you save your own troops. This is the way of good leadership. Now we are going to do lesson 131. So the army have appeared, the reds are the enemy this time, the whites are us. And then what happens is you've done it wrong. You've got to a position where you shouldn't be. You've got your back to difficult ground. You've not got ground that you can use. You've not got ground that is good. You simply are going to be crushed between difficult ground or your army has to disband and break up to get through it. So, for example, they can't move in formation. They have to break up. They have to try and get through it and they have to try. And you see, the army has lost unification. It's gone. So, in this situation, the Reds will just come up and mop up. They'll chase you through and kill everybody. So, what should you do in this situation? Which is one of those things in Sun Tzu that it doesn't happen often is you've messed up. You shouldn't be there. You've been outmaneuvered by the enemy. They've clearly done you. In this, in this instance alone, you simply attack the enemy. Go, they're not expecting it. Go full force. Use the best of your strategy you can and fight your way out. It's better to fight your way out than break up on terrain and be picked off in small groups. Stay together, form a wedge, get out, go to battle, join the battle. Remember, if you're outnumbered 10 to 1, you, you've had it. That You're never going to win. But also, you're never going to win if you're in 10 to 1 and you've put yourself in a position where you can't escape. This is entrapment ground. So simply, in this situation where you've messed up, fight. So we're going to look at lesson 140 and 141. Basically, uh, crossing a river and the issues with crossing a river. There's a lot more of this in the Book of Samurai series. So basically, get yourself the Book of Samurai series and it goes into this a lot deeper. It carries on from Sun Tzu. Now, to cross a river, you need to put pikes and archers at the front. Why? Because they have more range. And this is how you should cross a river. The first thing you should do is get your long range weapons across. But this is the important factor, space. There must be space when you cross the river. Do not have those guys simply just cross to the other side. Across and move out. It's the same with archers. They will cross and create a barrier so that the enemy cannot attack. Now the command group have crossed. The main bulk of the army, they've got enough space, there's lots of them there, and you've left a rear guard. There's a rear guard there to protect in case it's a surprise attack from the enemy. That is how you cross a river. The reason you do it this way is simply because if you don't leave space, your first people will move across and they're in the way. The second people will start stumbling in the river over the first people and they will trap the people at the rear there with the commander. This is really problematic. So basically Sun Tzu says, don't attack the enemy when they first get across. Let half of them get across. Let them get across. And when the rest are in the river, start attacking them. Because this will happen. They'll run back to the river. They... These guys will start drowning in the river. They'll start panicking because these guys have not left space for them. So they're panicking to get out. They're being pushed by these guys here. They're trying to get their way out. They're stuck with these guys. There's a big horde behind. All these guys here will be killed on this side, drowned here, and then left deserted on this side. 50% of the enemy army can be taken out simply by waiting to attack when the others get across 
That is why we create space first. Then we come across in units and we leave a rear guard. Then we're formed up, realign, move out. Okay, let's look at lesson 169, the terrains. This is accessible terrain because both people can get in, basically. They can get in and get out, no worries. But you see this here, this is the difficult bit, no retreat terrain. You can get over, that's fine. But this might be quite difficult. It might take each man a couple of minutes to climb over. So if they're winning and you're losing, you can't quite get back over it. You're stuck and they will go pepper, 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 kill, 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 and you're dead. If the same thing happens here, you just simply get out. That's it. Now we're going to look at this lesson 178 and different ways you can divide the enemy. We're going to go through this one, large and small divisions. Do you remember before we talked about there's the direct assault and the indirect troops? Yeah, do you remember that? They're the orthodox and the unorthodox. Mixed troops to create a single feeling in the army. Specialised, fast, hard troops that are your flanking units and um, unexpected tactics. These work together. They have to work together. If they don't work together, there's no point. Remember, this creates the diversion, the blockage, the focus. These gain the victory. So what does Sun Tzu say when he needs to fight against his own tactics? Okay, this is what we do. So let's take you through this. So remember, these want to talk, communicate and use the red fast troops at the side. That's what they're doing. So we send, the white team send blocker troops. You need to stop communications between the elite forces and the, and the standard central force to stop them moving together. So here we block that elite force, that elite force, and that one. We block them. Same on the other side. We block them. It doesn't matter how they might be on foot, they might be horseback. This is just symbolic. Remember that. So why do we do this? It's because they have a plan. They're, they are put in position to execute the unorthodox tactics. So what do we do? We use our main force here as the standard one and we attack with unorthodox elite troops. This, this army has to focus on this army because otherwise it'll just trounce through it because they're a solid form. So what they have to do is form up against them. These are your special tactics. They've done exactly the same thing, but we have blocked their tactics we've blocked their troops this is how you would separate an army divide the orthodox and the unorthodox do not like the standard troops talk to communicate or work with the elite troops divide them this is lesson 184 the famous snake technique this is the middle the head the tail if we attack the middle then both the head and the tail attack us. If we attack the middle, the head and the tail attack us. If we attack the tail, the middle will come in and the head will come round and will be surrounded. If we attack the opposite side to the head or the tail, again, these will move around, these will move around, and we'll be outflanked. Remember, I've just put a small amount there to show you, but the same principle applies. If you put all your forces there, these two tails will come in, the head and the tail. If you put all your forces here, their army will move around. If you put all your forces there, their army will move around that way. That is Sun Tzu's teaching of the snake. Lesson 187 talks about rigidity, flexibility, strength and weakness. Now, you must understand that in this situation, Sun Tzu only talks about the rigid and the flexible, but it is definitely from the Eastern concept of the four, rigid, strong, uh, flexible, strong and weak. So rigid is not moving and reinforced. Flexible is adaptable. Strong is like a great force. Weak is quick to disperse, break up and move away. So let's have a look at that. At least the first two, rigid and flexible. 
First of all, let's deal with rigidity. Imagine that we keep them as hard as possible. No matter how many cavalry attacks, no matter how many passes by, that army is not moving. They are fixed, they are set, they are just not moving. They are giving their all force back so that it, each time the cavalry come past or whoever, they just find it too difficult, they have to move off. There's no moving that army. Of course, you have to be in the right situation for this, but you will literally stand your ground. The next example is flexibility. The cavalry have come up there, boom, and you can very quickly manipulate your forces to a flexible line. You can adapt to the situation. So in this situation, you've allowed the cavalry to come in. And for obvious reasons, as you can see here, they're then flanked because very quickly you could move. It's not breaking, that's flexibility. You've stayed in the same position, but you have adapted your force to the situation. Weakness is to break and go away quickly, then regroup, break, go away quickly, regroup. Flexibility is to move and manipulate the situation you are in. Don't forget that. Strength is to move forward, to attack. So the next one we're gonna look at is the fire scroll, the use of fire or attacking with fire. Now there are five types of fire attack. You can burn people, okay? You can burn food and stores. If you can't take the enemy's stores, burn them. Just because you can't get them doesn't mean you should leave them there. So it might seem disastrous to burn through what you could really use. And in fact, earlier on, Sun Tzu says, get as many as you can. But the simple fact is, if you can't carry them away without getting attacked, you haven't like killed the enemy, then burn them and stop the starve the enemy. It's a great tactic. So burn supply trains and vehicles, Basically, any vehicle or the baggage train, set them on fire with arson attacks. And that, that does the same as number two. But this is stationary. Number three is on the move. You can burn equipment, buildings, places. So we're talking about if people have um, a fortress, burn it down. If they've got um, equipment dumps, burn them. And the last is burn formations. So when you have a formation, burn it and divide them. Once they're together, use fire, smoke, acidic smoke, bombs, landmines, caltrops, you know, burning caltrops, spinning firecrackers. It doesn't matter what, um, oil, anything, burn those troops because it will divide the army. Now, these guys here, they've set up their camp and their attack lines using a natural water defense so they can't be attacked from that side they're relaxing they've got their camp structure out they you know they're waiting for something to happen but they're settled at the time so what should you do well let's turn to a lesson 208 the redirection of water very few people think about this but water is actually quite easy to redirect when you have manpower it's actually fairly easy. So at the top of that river there, if you follow it up to its source, there'll be an alternative path you can send it down. Now, what you do here is you've got thousands of men at your disposal and they've all got digging, trench equipment, everything. They've got plenty of equipment to dig fortresses, to dig trenches, all of that. So you take a thousand men from your army, you go up river and you redirect it. You spend two or three days redirecting the river what happens is it finds a new route and all of a sudden this dries up all of a sudden that dries up and you find their natural defense has gone lesson 205 is one of the only examples of esoteric teachings inside of sun tzu but yet it's not really esoteric in the sense it's more pseudo science you need fire to spread you need the smoke to spread and you need to be doing it in the correct direction. Otherwise, you'll burn your own troops. So, in Sun Tzu, he says, the ancient teaching is thus. When these the moon passes these four stars, as you can see there, Sagittarius, Pegasus, Crater, Corvus, you can see that these four stars and the moon crosses their path, there will be wind. This I personally have never tested. 
I would like to do one day. But I've included them here. Obviously, it's part of Sun Tzu's Art of War, so you get them all. But I've actually given you the star names and I've given you their, um, their position within the constellations of the sky. And you can see those. Now we are going to focus on the final chapter, the chapter 13, the use of spies. Now, as you can see, that means scroll. Then this is use and that is spy. This is different to the Japanese kan, uh, the Japanese kanji, the ideogram for ninja. This is basically gate with a sun in the middle. So that's a Chinese gate. That's a sun. And it means, and the pronunciation in Japanese is kan. And when the gate opens slightly, the sunshine or the moon, depending on the, the age of the kanji, will come through the gap. So this means the use of gaps. And that ideogram became spy because spies look for gaps. If you want to know what the Japanese ninja thought of the 13th chapter by Sun Tzu, you need to read this book, Iga and Koka Ninja Skills. You need to read this book. It was written by a ninja called Chikamatsu Shigenori. And if you turn, if you turn to page 1301, you'll find here an Iga and Koka commentary on Sun Tzu's use of spies. This is the actual words of two ninja talking about the 13th chapter of Sun Tzu's Art of War in the 1700s. And it's in that book there, so please do support uh, what I do in this channel. And that, of course, will give you more information on Sun Tzu. So let's pretend we are the red team this time. And we need to know, are the whites going to go left or are they going to go right? If we, the red, choose the wrong direction, they're going to outflank us. We don't know their movements. So it would be amazing if we could predict their movements. This is done through spies. Spies in the enemy camp will be listening to things, picking up information and generally getting to understand what the enemy are going to do. You have different level spies, which we'll go through in a moment. So in this situation, we don't know which way the enemy are going to go. But if we've been had reports from our spies and all our intelligence is correct, we found out they're going to go and attack this place over here. So they've moved over there. But we knew this in advance, so we've hidden a counter-attack here. We knew where they were going to be, we knew how to counter it, and now they are trapped. Why? Because the spies have told us. This is a basic setup or a basic example of what I mean, but in a very complex world or the complex world of military strategy, this is just a simple symbolic representation of it. Know where the enemy will be and prep for them. How do you do this? You don't do it by asking the spirits or chanting or special magical things. You do it by sending out spies. That is the lesson Sun Tzu tells us when he says, you need to know where they are. Foreknowledge is golden. Let's start here with lesson 219. Now, these are the five types of spy. As you can see by uh, Giles, local, inward, converted, doomed, surviving. I'm going to take you through those. So if you've got the book, turn to that page. But this is what I want to show you first. This is the enemy forces on the outside. That's the enemy forces on the inside. By that, I mean they have direct contact with him, the Lord. They are inside forces. These just happen to work in the local area. They happen to be either the lower ranking soldiers of the enemy or shopkeepers, um, merchants, traveling people within the area, that type of thing. They live in the area, they are local, but they are outside of the main internal military focus. And of course, when you get in the internal military, there are levels of more and more levels of internal information. So these guys know more than this guy. This guy is obviously making all the decisions and has one or two favorites. So these are the concentric rings of information starting at the outside. So we have a spy and we send our spy to talk to the enemy locals. We get information about the local environment, the local politics, the local um, 
feelings against the Lord, the local pathways, the hunter's tracks, everything we can, we find. We take money and we use a living spy. This is spy number five. We use the living spy to go and talk to different people in the local area. When the time comes, we use the local person as a guide. That is a living spy talking to a uh, local spy. He might not be in the military. I've just got that figure. Just, But the point is, he might be a local who knows the area or he has a shop nearby or he might be in the low-level soldiers con conscripted from the farms of that land. Now here, we've gone to the inner circle. Okay, we've gone to the inner circle. Our spy has actually found a contact in the enemy ranks, like the real close enemy ranks, the people on the inside of the castle. He has a contact. The person he spoke to, so the man in white is a living spy. He's our main spy. And he's talking to anyone. It should just be someone who works in the office, someone who, the quartermaster. It could be someone, the caretaker in the army or the, the person who fixes the chariot wheels. Or it could be that he's actually gone right to the highest levels and found a spy, or sorry, not a spy, found a person willing to give information for money, sex, um, they want land in another province. Each time it's different, but they go closer and closer to the enemy lord to get internal information. This is a living spy, the man in white, talking to somebody who becomes an internal spy. So the man in red is the enemy's living spy. He's come out to try to convince some of our people, the locals or the inner side, to, talk, uh, to turn and speak to him and give him information. He's doing the exact same job as this guy. So what should we do? You get both living spies, both living spies talk to each other. That's what you do. Whether they know they're spies or not, you're unsure. That That is one of the things you have to deal with when you're there. But both living spies now are trying to make the third type of spy, which is converted spy or reversed spy. This is the internal dynamics at play here. This man wants to make this man that. This man wants to make this man on his side. That's what they're trying to do. They're both trying to convert each other. Okay, so let's have a go. So they're talking, they're talking. And our white spy, the white team spy, finds a weakness. His weakness might be sex. His weakness might be honour or righteousness. He might f want to increase his lands. We don't know. We have to talk to him. And again, you should read Chikamatsu Shigenori's Eager and Coco Ninja for all of these tactics. They're all in there. Now, what happens now is that living spy becomes a converted spy. In, in co common terms, it's a double agent. He's changed his flag and now he goes back. The Lord thinks he's talking to his living spy. He's like, ah, my living spy. But if he knew the truth, he could understand that he's actually talking to a converted enemy spy. He's giving the secrets right away to the enemy. He moves back and chats and chats and chats to our living spy. And then we find out who is best to approach. We need someone on the inside. So we've got him. We've got our living spy. Sorry, the enemy's living spy. Now we need to find more internal spies. So our converted spy, who used to have a red flag, has now said that that man in the middle actually wants to defect he's not happy with the lord there's a problem 
that he wants more money, he's greedy, or there's a reason why he is someone we can approach. That is why converted spies are the most important spies, because they can tell you everything from the inside. Because as a spy themselves, like a professional spy, they have a direct access straight to the Lord. So what happens now is we take away him. He's still there. But now he's changed sides. Now let's look at the setup of the enemy. Already we have internal spies. We have local agents. We have spies who have been converted. You can start to see why Sun Tzu says spies are the most important thing within the army. Look, locals we have on our side. Inner spies we have on our side. Right next to the commander, we have converted someone to our side. We have an internal spy. And then we have a double agent, the converted spy, feeding false information to the Lord. False information is going in through the spy and coming out through uh, the internal spy. He is now giving us internal information because the converted spy told us who to approach. If we randomly approach everyone, we're going to the enemy will know what we are doing. But if we pinpoint and hit the correct person because our converted spy tells us that he wants the defect, we have a perfect place, a perfect plan in place. The fourth of the spies, the fourth type is the doomed spy. This chap is our living spy. This chap is our doomed spy. The living spy or the Lord gives him false information. He tells him something plausible that might work, but he um, doesn't give him the truth. He gives him something that when the enemy finds it out, they will make the incorrect move. But it is believable. And this is how it works. The living spy retreats. The doomed spy, he thinks he's the Don Juan. He thinks he's amazing and he's going to be the master spy. He's got the correct information and he's been given a false task to do. He's been told he's got to say, speak to some locals. So he goes off and he speaks. So he goes off and he speaks to some locals. But an internal spy. Let's get him. Our internal spy. He tells the commander, he says, I found a spy in the enemy ranks. We have given him this information. The commander says, arrest him. So they arrest him and he thinks, oh no, I've done it wrong. I thought I was really good, but I've been captured. He is then interrogated by the enemy and he gives his information directly to the Lord. He says, oh, we're going to move, you know, we're going to move our armies west. We're going to do this. The Lord has had his kneecaps removed. He's had his toes broken. He's done everything. Or he says, I'll tell you what, work for me as a converted spy. So again, the cycle goes round again. He said, OK, you know how much? But the point here is the doom spy will either be killed or try to be converted. He has fed the enemy false information. Now the enemy is rife with our men. They've been given false information. They've killed one of our own spies and they believe it's true that the information they've got because it's plausible. And at the other end of the scale, at the other end of the battlefield, we are making moves that support that information, even though we know it's false and it's not true. That is the doomed spy. That leaves us with the fifth one, which is the living spy, which you've come across all the way through this because we use our living spy. The living spy is the most used man. The most important spy is the converted spy there because he in the centre knows how to get to the hearts of all these people 
and get as many white flags in the red terrain as possible. This is how we have disrupted the enemy before we've even started the war. That happens before you go to war. This is the art of the spy. So we then move to lesson 230. If anybody talks about this, anybody releases information about what we're doing, you kill the person who released the information and you kill the person who heard the information. You never let out your secret plans. And finally, guys, just to polish it off, you employ assassins. You make or you take the opportunity to kill others. In this situation, either our doomed spy or our living spy will try to assassinate someone of useful, a useful target. So the Lord or a high ranking general, something like that. This is the time. If you get the opportunity, you will strike the enemy where you can from the inside. OK, guys, that sums up the basic overview of the art of war. Obviously, I've focused on the more physical things. I've used the miniatures to help show these uh, these situations. But we are the main book we are using is The Ultimate Art of War, a step-by-step -step illustrated guide by me, Anthony Cummins. We have used Isui Sensei's teachings from the 1600s. So that's in the Book of Samurai 1 and the Book of Samurai 2. And we've used Chikamatsu Shigenori's teachings from the 1700s to focus on the spying and espionage. So these are all published by me. So if you want to support me in this channel, please do get yourself a copy of some of those and pass this video around. Right, guys, this is the face behind the, the, the books and the, the video. So I hope you enjoyed that. I really do. My name is Anthony Cummins. I'm on a quest to sort of find out what did the samurai and ninja really do. And of course, that starts fundamentally with the art of war and Sun Tzu and China 2000 years before that. So I hope you enjoyed that. Please subscribe. Please let me know what you think. If you're interested in more videos like this, Basically, you can look up um, Takeda versus Tokugawa, another video I did with the miniatures. And if you want to know more about me, then look up a new ninja documentary 2020 or The Man Who Killed the Ninja. And you'll see me there in a full documentary by Ryan Stone and Ryan Stone Productions or Stone Brother Productions. OK, guys, I hope you enjoyed that. Let me know what you think in the comments below. I'll read them as best I can. And I hope you subscribe and see future videos.